still making their way in, but just to keep us moving uh, on time here, um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So I want to uh, first thank everybody for uh, joining us today for our lecture, uh, Robert H. Prine, an Albany Yankee in the Tycoon's Courts uh, by Dr. Susanna Fessler. Um, this is definitely a very strange time. So many of you are regulars to our Sunday afternoon uh, lectures at the museum. Uh, you know, we're not able to do that today and, and I hope everybody uh, is, who's here is, is happy, safe, healthy, sane, uh, and being able to get through this difficult time together. It's, it's great to see uh, many of your, of your faces that I haven't had a chance to see since we haven't been in the museum for a couple months now. Um, this is the first of what will probably be many virtual lectures and programs in the coming months, um, even once we are able to get back into the museum. Uh, and when we are able to have visitors back in the museum, it's likely that we will be hosting uh, programs virtually for quite some time so that everybody is able to participate. So please make sure that you're keeping an eye on the museum's website and social media sites. We are doing a lot of digital and virtual program that's different than the museum has done in the past. Um, there's a new blog post uh, page uh, for everything from behind the scenes of collections uh, to stuff that, that's going on in the library to different education programs and art programs. Um, there are different videos that we upload to our Facebook, uh, Twitter, social, uh, YouTube, and other social media sites too. So please make sure you're keeping an eye out for those different programs and those different things that we've been doing um, during uh, this sort of shutdown period. Uh, for our lecture today, uh, just make sure that your mic is on mute. Um, whether you have your video on is really up to your own, own comfort, uh, but if we could just have everybody make sure that their mic is muted for the presentation so that we don't have any background noise going on. Uh, we will be doing a Q&A after the presentation. In order to do the Q&A, we will use the the chat box uh, that you can find, there's a little chat button either at the bottom of your screen or off to the right hand side, depending on what kind of setup you have there. Uh, at any point during the lecture, if you have a question, you can go ahead and type your question right in uh, to the chat box and we will answer, we'll have uh, Dr. Fessler answering questions at the end of her presentation. Uh, I would like to introduce at this point uh, our education assistant, Victoria Waldron, who on your screen is identified as Nikki Brown. Uh, she, it, uh, that's Victoria. She will be doing the Q&A at the end of this session. Uh, I have a one-year-old who is currently napping, who is likely to wake up during uh, this presentation at some point, so I may uh, be dropping out um, somewhere uh, during the presentation, um, and Victoria will be handling uh, the Q&A session at the end. If you have any questions, any technical issues come up for you, please feel free to type them into the chat box as well, and we will do the best as we can uh, to help uh, take care of any of those issues that might pop up um, during the presentation. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Susanna Fessler, uh, who is a professor of East Asian Studies at the University of Albany. She is also the Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. Her research spans modern Japanese literature with an historical bent. She received her PhD in East Asian languages and literatures from Yale University in 1994 and moved to Albany the same year. She is currently transcribing the personal letters in the Prine Collection at the Albany Institute of History and Art and hopes to publish them in one form or another within the next couple of years. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, pass it over to Dr. Fessler. Thank you very much, and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, this was originally scheduled before COVID, and I was really disappointed that we had to reschedule it, um, but I'm really glad to be the guinea pig for these talks, these Zoom talks. I'm going to share my screen.
Okay. Um, this talk is about Robert Houston Prime, and uh, I gave it a kind of punchy title there, an Albany Yankee in the Tycoon's Court. Uh, and uh, many of you, I looked at the people signing in, uh, have talked with me already about who Prine is, but just to give you a little bit of a background about him, for those of you who don't know his history, uh, he was an Albanian. Uh, he was born in 1815, died in 1882. Um, this is the portrait that I think he liked the most, the photograph or the, the rendering of his image that he liked the most, and we're going to see a different one later on that's owned by the Institute in a few minutes uh, that he didn't like very much. Uh, he was uh, all manner of different things. So uh, he studied law, he was active in the military, um, he was a diplomat, that's what I'm going to be talking about largely today, uh, and he was also a politician. Um, and in the realm of politics, he served as Speaker of the New York Assembly twice, uh, once in 1850 and once in 1854. Uh, he was also the Adjutant General of New York, 1855 to 1857. Uh, and uh, along with that was the title of Brigadier General, so that's the military side. He actually never saw action as a military man, but he was quite conscious of holding that um, that rank. Uh, and later in life, uh, he got interested in railroads and he became a railroad executive. Um, after, this is after his um, stint in Japan. So he really, it's hard to categorize him as one type of person. Um, the other thing that he did was that he was a businessman and uh, he and his brother-in-law, Charles B. Lansing, um, ran the Albany Iron and Saw Works. This is an advertisement that you see on your screen that was in the Albany Directory in um, 1863. So he and Prine and his brother-in-law ran this business and um, in 1861, by 1861, uh, the, the works as they called them were not doing very well financially. So Prine had gotten himself into debt and he really felt uncomfortable about that. If there's one thing that he hated, it was financial debt. And around the same time, this opportunity appeared and that was an opportunity to go to Japan as the US minister, in this case, the second minister uh, to Japan. Japan had just recently opened its doors to the outside world and um, the United States was responsible for that having happened. And so Prine saw this as an opportunity uh, not just to earn great prestige uh, and represent the United States, but he also saw it as a way to get himself out of debt. And I can't go into too much detail about that right uh, today, but um, the short story of that is that the pay and the way he was paid ended up being much more lucrative than the business at the works. So the plan was that he was going to go to Japan and uh, he was uh, going to save up enough money while he was there, send the money home, get himself out of debt, and everything would be happy. So he leaves Albany in 1861, but he does not take his whole family along. He was a family man, a very dedicated family man, uh, but he decided to take with him two of his three children. So he took his eldest son, Edward, and his next son, Robert, and everybody refers to Robert as Bertie or Burr, uh, leaving behind his youngest son, whose name was Charlie. Charlie was really too young to travel to Japan, so they decided, he and his wife decided that the wife, whose name was Jane, but he calls her Jenny, would stay home in Albany, and Prime would go off with his two sons on this great adventure to the other side of the world. And it was also a hope that it would be restorative to um, both uh, Robert H. Prine's health and to his son Edward's health. They had nondescript, non, not very carefully um, diagnosed chronic illnesses, at least that's what they refer to in their letters. 
nothing serious. They just thought this would be a, a, a better environment, right? So what we see here is a photograph of Bertie, the, the younger of the two sons who traveled with Prime. Uh, this is a photograph that is in the Institute and it's dated to 1863. So Bertie is about 16 years old in this photograph. So Prime leaves Albany, he leaves his wife Jenny, he leaves his youngest son Charlie. And um, the other thing to mention is that the Primes had a daughter. Uh, they had four children originally, but the daughter had died in childhood. And so it was probably emotionally pretty difficult for the wife in particular, for Jane, to see her husband leaving with two of her three remaining children. And I also want to just give a shout out to all the folks in the library. I saw Prentice had signed on and I'm not sure who else of the volunteers uh, are listening today, but uh, they make this project an absolute joy. They are wonderful people. Uh, and here's a photograph of the library, right? So Prine wrote these long, extremely long, usually, letters to his wife. He, he was constantly writing to her. He'd start a letter, and then he'd pick it up the next day and put it down, pick it up the next day. And, and so as you're reading through the letters, you can follow his daily life and different events. And they're all very personal. And these are not things that he anticipated would be published at any given time. So these letters all sit, uh, well, most of them sit in the Albany Institute. It's clear from my research that there are some that are not part of the collection that probably are not extant anymore. They got lost or they just didn't get saved or something like that. Sometimes uh, Prime will refer to a letter and it's just not there in the collection. Uh, but um, what the Institute has looks on the shelf like not that much. Uh, the volunteers are probably smiling when, they, when I say that because I always walk in, I say I want box two or I want box three. And most everything what I do is in two different boxes and the boxes aren't that big, but it is a massive, massive collection. Um, so uh, I wanted to say a little bit about what the challenges of this research are before I talk about the content of the research. Uh, first of all, one of the big problems is that Prine had notoriously bad handwriting, even Prine himself. Uh, would often write in his letters to his wife, can you read this? I can't read, you know, I'm, I'm not doing a very good job writing or something. So let me read what you're seeing on your screen. He says, I cannot write decently on this paper from some defect, probably in its manufacture, the ink occasionally spreads in a manner and to an extent far from ornamental. And then again, as I am obliged to hold my pen, it will occasionally make its way through to the other side. And as I, as I am at a loss, when I occasionally venture to look back, I am at a loss to read what I've written. I fear you will have much difficulty to decipher it. I see I have now repeated the words at a loss, etc., but I do not strike it out as the page is already sufficiently unsightly. But you can read, I observe, more easily what another sheet is held under, as the writing on the reverse does not show through so much. Uh, and indeed, when I'm looking at these letters at the Institute, I often try and put some dark colored piece of paper underneath to, to uh, reduce the contrast. So this is one of the big problems is that Prime's handwriting is really quite bad. I'm sure his wife was uh, proficient at reading it, but it took me a long time to get used to it. Uh, there's also letters in the Prime collection at the Institute from other people. Uh, this is a note from Thurlow Weed. If you know a little bit about Albany history, that name probably strikes uh, accord with you. And Thurlow Weed also had some pretty bad handwriting. Uh, this particular letter that we're looking at right now says, Dear Robert, this is new and startling. Perhaps it may not come up tonight. If it does, before there be time for consultation, it must take its course. Let me see you if possible tonight. Yours truly, Thurlow Weed, or T. Weed in this case. Um, so it's not just Prime that we have to deal with, it's lots of other um, scribbles. And um, one of the other challenges is that the collection contains not just letters that were final things that he sent to his wife, but letters like what you see on your screen right now, which was a draft. This was a draft of a letter that Prime wrote to his son-in-law, or to his brother-in-law, Charlie, 
uh, this is after he returned from Japan, and um, it's a bit of a challenge to know what actually ended up in the final version. He goes through and he crosses out bits and pieces. Uh, I don't have the final version. We don't have that. Charlie didn't save it. I'm not surprised because this is actually a very angry letter. Uh, the two were fighting about uh, money, and um, I'm sure that there's a good chance Charlie read the letter and threw it in the fire out of anger or something like that. So that, that's a little bit of a challenge also. Um, there's also the problem of the mouse ate my homework. So some of this material suffers from damage like you see here, clearly a rodent had chewed into it. Uh, and then finally, there's the problem of the, the letter got a little too close to the candle flame or something like that. And so bits of it got burnt away. So uh, it's a big collection, but it's still missing little bits and pieces. Nonetheless, I have been delving through and um, transcribing all of these materials. And I'm just about done with uh, the letters that Pine wrote home to his wife. If you're in publishing, then the numbers I'm about to quote will mean something to you. Uh, the final uh, compilation of all of those letters is over 300,000 words. So that's about three times the size of a normal monograph that you might see from a university press or something like that. It's really quite a lot. So let me talk about what the content is and about this adventure. There's a lot of um, different adventures that Prine has. I'm just going to focus on a few today in the interest of time. He leaves Albany and he goes down to New York City with uh, his sons and they leave New York City on January 1st of 1862. So they take the, the boat down and they go across the Panama Isthmus. They, they arrive at the Panama Isthmus on January 11th, 1862. And you might be wondering, why did they do this? Why didn't they just go across land? And the answer is that this is before the, the Transcontinental Railroad was built. So this was the fastest way to get to the West Coast and then eventually to Japan. And on this particular map, every one of those blue points that I have marked, I know for sure are places that they were because Prine and one of his sons uh, carefully noted, recorded their latitude and their longitude on a regular basis. So even when they're out the ocean, uh, they would record this so we can actually trace where they went. So they cross the Panama Isthmus uh, on January 11th, and they finally arrive in San Francisco on January 26th. Now the problem is, in a way, that um, when they got down to the Isthmus, they, the, can, the canal isn't there. They have to uh, cross over by land, and they do that. They take a train, and um, they, get, uh, uh, they go off, um, off of the train very briefly. And while that happened, while they were on the isthmus, it seems, although uh, the medical records are a little bit foggy on this, uh, that Edward was possibly bitten by a mosquito, something like that. Um, by the time they got to San Francisco, he had fallen gravely ill. This is a photo of what San Francisco looked like in 1860. So it was a new town. It was also a very expensive town, which made Pine kind of crazy. Uh, and um, so they arrived in San Francisco and Eddie is sick. Eddie is really quite sick. Uh, he has a fever and all kinds of other bad symptoms. And so they contact a doctor and um, it, this illness just gets worse. It gets a little better and then it gets worse and worse and worse. And um, eventually, very tragically, Eddie dies in San Francisco. Um, the diagnosis for Prime was typhoid fever. That too is not exactly clear whether it was typhoid or something else. Uh, but in a way, that's not the important thing. The important thing is that Eddie dies while he's in San Francisco. So the whole trip kind of gets put on hold while Prime has to deal with this. And um, he has to arrange for uh, Eddie's entombment, which he does uh, temporarily. Um, here's a picture of the Lone Mountain Cemetery. And this is where the uh, temporary entombment happened. And he writes to his wife, 
This afternoon, we inter his remains temporarily in the receiving vault of the Lone Mountain Cemetery at three and a half o'clock, Bishop Kip performing the last sad rites. This was probably a really hard letter for him to write. Uh, initially, he sent a telegram to his wife uh, to let her know what had happened, and then he had to write a much longer letter explaining the whole history of it. And uh, that letter is in the Albany Institute. So he breaks the bad news. He's personally devastated. Uh, his trip has been interrupted in a most unfortunate way. So he gets stuck in San Francisco because there just isn't convenient transportation to Japan and he has to deal with Eddie's death and he says to his wife, I scarcely know what to say or how to say. My mouth is parched, my throat is choked, and yet tomorrow by 8 o'clock a.m. all that I can say must be in the hands of the express company. That's a letter dated February 10th, 1862. And he writes again to his wife, my stay here in San Francisco is growing daily more irksome. Time hangs heavily, nothing to do. He's sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting for transportation to Japan. Much as I desire to sail, I shall leave with a heavy heart. Favorable winds will bear me farther from you and the remains of our darling boy. He wrote that on March 10th of 1862. Finally, on, uh, in the middle of March, they find transportation. They go from San Francisco through the Hawaiian Islands and they arrive in Japan on April 25th. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I wrote 63, it's 62, my mistake. They arrive on April 25th, 1862. Um, so Japan is this new happening place uh, with a handful of foreign dignitaries, and now Prime is a new one of those. And uh, they live all in one basic area. I have a map here, I did not draw this map, but it should give you an idea. Uh, the basic uh, layout here, the foreign legations between 1859 and 1860 were in uh, what today is Tokyo, uh, but at the time was called Edo. And so we see Edo Bay and uh, we, this area here is central modern Tokyo. Uh, the U.S. legation was further south, it was down in the Zenpukuji Temple. And you can see there was also the French legation down here, right, in another temple. And a lot of times people will say, gee, you know, what's with the temples? Why did they put foreigners in the temples? And the answer is, well, where else are you going to put them? You, you can't put them in a typical uh, residence house. Those were too small. Uh, and there was no such thing as a business building, uh, an office building. And so, we, but there were a lot of temples, a lot of Buddhist temples. And so the Buddhist temples uh, would get repurposed uh, and made into these, um, these legations. I'm gonna say a little bit more about the location of that legation uh, as we progress here. Um, this is a photograph that's at the Institute, and uh, Prine has annotated it, but because his handwriting is kind of hard to read, I've given it to you uh, right below that, showing the roofs and the flagstaff of the U.S. legation in Edo. And the larger building is the temple at Zen Fukuji. So <clears throat> this uh, was where Townsend Harris, who was the first American minister, uh, lived, and then Prine and his son took up residence in April of 1862. This particular building was destroyed in a fire in 1863. This photograph was uh, taken on a very calm day, so the American flag is just kind of hanging limp there. Uh, Prime writes this about the temple to his wife. He says, the temple we occupy is famous all over Japan. It is a holy place and one not likely to be intruded on. The name is Zenpukuji, or True Happiness Temple, G always terminating the names of the temples, an actually meaning temple. The priest is the descendant of a high officer of the Mikado, which means the emperor, uh, from whom it was obtained. Now, to be honest, I think that uh, the Japanese told Prine how wonderful this temple was to make him feel good about being there. Uh, I'm not sure how much of a holy place it was, really, uh, seeing as it was repurposed to be the American legation, but there it is. 
so these photographs that I'm going to be showing you, as I said, they're in the Albany Institute. Um, they were taken by a young man whose name was Gulick, uh, who uh, traveled with Prime to Japan from the Hawaiian Islands, actually. It's where he picked them up. Uh, and um, some of the, the photos that we see here are um, the earliest, some of the earliest photos. That, there really aren't that many early photos of Japan, but we will see um, what we've got for the most part. Also in the Institute is this photograph, which is the gateway to the United States legation in Yeddo, in Edo. Uh, and this is what Prine writes to his wife about this. He says, I send you also a view of the entrance to our temple being the second entrance about 300 feet back of a gateway at the street and a view of one of the many buildings with the enclosure, mainly for the purpose of giving you a glimpse of our famous big tree, a part of which is seen at the right. There are no other views here at present, but I'll try to get some. So he's trying to give her a feel of where they're living and what that basically looks like. This is another picture by Gulick that Prine sends to his wife, and it is labeled Street in Edo, showing a platform with trees, flower, and paper ornaments uh, on it for a festival, or the Japanese word for this is omatsuri. Uh, so Prine says to his wife, what a night. It was the omatsuri, or great festival day of Japan, and the village officer had sent me word that we would be honored by an opportunity to participate and until near three o'clock, there was an incessant noise of drums or tom-toms, singing that 40 cats could not excel, and the shrill noise of the fifes or the flutes. Uh, so Prime was not particularly excited about these festivals, and uh, he, you know, he, he tells his wife that. He often um, makes some kind of, uh, to use a modern term, a kind of snarky tone about some of the things that uh, he sees. Some of the other photographs at the Institute uh, are this one. This is a portion of what was known as the Tycoon's Cemetery. The Prime consistently uses the word tycoon to refer to what today uh, in Japanese studies we refer to as the shogun, who was the military leader of the country. Uh, but all, at that time, uh, all the foreign diplomats used the word tycoon. Uh, so Prime was granted permission to visit the castle in Edo, which was the military capital, and um, the Tycoon Cemetery, the Shogun Cemetery, uh, was there. He got to go and take his photographer and take some friends. Um, this was a really rare treat, in a way, a rare occasion. It wasn't often that people were allowed on these grounds, uh, and this photograph is one of a series of eight that was made on that day that are in the Institute. Um, the, the Tycoon Cemetery doesn't exist anymore. Um, it was uh, destroyed in World War II, so we, I can't show you um, current photographs of it. This is another photograph from uh, the Tycoon Cemetery. And if you look really, really closely at the very center of this photograph, you can see a photographer bending over a tripod. So there was more than one photographer there. Okay. Um, Prine often describes the samurai using the term yakunin, and that really is a Japanese word. It means an official. Um, and this is a, a photograph that Gulick took that um, shows probably typically what these Japanese officials, government officials, look like uh, when they showed up and they would visit Prine quite often in the course of business. And they also were his attendants. Uh, so he was almost never alone. The Japanese didn't want him to be alone. They feared for his life, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a couple minutes. Um, so he writes to his wife, uh, he's, right when he first arrives in Japan, and he's trying to tell her all about what life is like, and one of the things that he describes is horseback riding. And he says, rides, when we rode out, we were accompanied by 28 yakunins and preceded by 22 betos, and if you're kind of wondering what a betto is, this is a betto. This photograph is not by Gulick. This is by the other main, main photographer of early Japan, whose name was Biato. And uh, the betto was someone who, usually it's translated as a horse groom. It was somebody who would run alongside the horse 
as you were out for your ride. Uh, and it seems almost superhuman. If the horse was galloping, I'm not sure how they could do this, but this is what, they, this is what their job was. So to go back to what Brian was saying, 22, uh, 28 Yakunins and 22 Bethos who run ahead like deer shouting when necessary to clear the way. All horsemen and footmen stand aside before a superior. Our Yakunins, of course, are two sworded men. Two sworded, it's S-W-O-R-D-E-D. -E -D, right? They carry two swords. Uh, and they're very civil and attentive. And indeed, in this photograph, we can see uh, that this, uh, this Yakunin he actually, in this photograph, has three swords, which is kind of strange, but um, it, it, traditionally a samurai would carry two swords. There's a long sword you can see right here, and then there's a short sword right here. Right? Um, and then I don't know why, maybe for dramatic effect, they also gave him a Western style epee, uh, but that would not be typically the kind of thing that a samurai would carry. And the samurai were the only people who were allowed to carry swords uh, in this, at this time in Japan. So Prine is always describing them either as Yakunin or two sworded men, men who carry two swords. Um, he also tells his wife about the roads. He says the roads are traveled mostly by footmen. They are hard, clean, and macadamized with a kind of gravel or rubble. They are ancient and some extend for hundreds of miles and were in existence before Adam had the prefix of mc to his name. So it's kind of making a joke there. Uh, anyway, um, this is a, a photograph of the rather famous Tokaido, which is the main road, the artery road that runs from uh, modern day Tokyo or Edo at the time uh, down to Kyoto. And um, this photograph was taken around the time that Prime was there. You notice that most of what you see are its foot traffic. It's not carriages. Uh, and occasionally you'd see people on horseback, but most of the travel is happening uh, by foot. And then he describes going through the countryside on a, on a ride with Townsend Harris, the first American minister who was sort of seeing him off. He says, Mr. Harris took us principally through the suburbs where we had quiet shaded lanes, some of which as rural as if there had been a small country population. And yet all around, hill, valley, and field were teeming with population. Every small piece of land is put to use. When trees are cut down, others are almost invariably planted. The consequence is that the island, as far as I've seen, is covered wherever the eye turns with the most beautiful trees. Half the land appears to be wooded. The trees grow to a giant height. Cedars large and straight enough to make spars for ships, if not masts. Uh, so what you just saw was that panoramic view of what Prime could see when he looked out over the city. Um, now, the American legation, he lives there for about a year with his son, uh, but in May of 1863, the legation is burned to the ground. Prime is woken up out of a deep sleep and um, he's told that the place is burning and he's got to get out. Uh, he suspected later on that it was arson, uh, but couldn't prove it, and the Japanese never wanted to admit it. Uh, and you might think, why did they, why did they set fire to the legation? And the idea was that they, they really were trying to get the foreigners out of the city, right? Um, most of the foreigners who lived in that uh, part of, um, it, most of the foreign ministers, um, had already left Edo by this point. They'd gone, they'd gone further south, and I'll show you a map in a second. Um, and uh, that was convenient for the Japanese because they really didn't want the foreigners in their military capital. They kind of wanted to contain them outside of the city where they could keep track of them and, and protect them and um, make sure that they weren't meddling in, in Japanese business. Um, so, this is what Prime writes to his wife uh, right after this fire. He says, you will not expect a long letter from me, my beloved wife, when you learn that, as usual, I have to write with only a few hours to spare before the mail leaves and under the disadvantage of having very little facilities as at two o'clock in the morning of the 24th, the legation building was totally destroyed by fire. And you just have to think about his poor wife, you know, this letter took months probably two or three months to reach Albany. Uh, 
And then she opens it up and she reads that sentence. And he starts it off just kind of sounding very normal. Most of his letters start out this way. And then he says, oh, and by the way, my house burned to the ground. And then he says, uh, it is said to have been accidental and to have originated in a small building adjoining the kitchen. You will remember that I have already informed you that all of our partitions were of paper, thick where privacy was to be secured, thin when light was desired. You will not be surprised to hear, therefore, that in the short space of 15 minutes, the whole 200 feet of building was in flames. I saved the books and archives, all damaged by the rain, however, but furniture and clothing, except about a change and what was in the wash, all destroyed. The silver, with the exception of four salt cell cellars and two teaspoons, saved. The last thing I gave up was the copy of your ambrotype I kept. But Bertie was crying, Father, the building is all on fire. Come or you will be injured. And I gave it up. But fortunately, had placed in it, had placed it in the top of my trunk, which was safe, though nearly empty, having in it only a change of linen for Kanagawa, which is where um, he was headed. The Bible you gave me is saved, a little wet, and the guard chain. So his poor wife, she reads this letter and finds out that, his, uh, that he, he did escape the fire uh, unharmed, but he lost just about everything. So what happens? He had been living in Edo, which is at the top of the screen, and then he had to move because the, the legation was burned down. He had to move down to Kanagawa, which was right across the bay from Yokohama. And Yokohama, he had split his time between um, Kanagawa and Yokohama. He, he didn't really want to live in Yokohama. He'd only visit there. Um, he saw it as a kind of den of iniquity. This is where many of the merchants were living. And uh, he felt like he was a better than that uh, environment. Uh, and he was a diplomat, so he needed to be separate. Uh, but the, the salient point here is, you also notice on this map that this is the Tokaido Highway. The print is kind of small, but you can see it there, the Tokaido Highway. Uh, and that ran from Edo down to Yokohama, now that, or to Kanagawa. The Japanese really wanted the foreigners to um, not even be in Kanagawa. They wanted them to be in Yokohama because you can see Yokohama is off of the beaten path. Um, this was a very heavily traveled highway, not just by foreigners, but by everybody. Uh, and um, you can see here that it says treaty, a treaty travel limits from Kanagawa. What that meant was if you're a foreigner, you can't go north of that line without permission because as you go north of that line, you're getting closer and closer to the military capital. So Prime was a little bit of a thorn in the side of the Japanese uh, government, of the military government, because even after they burnt him out of Edo, um, he didn't want to go and live in Yokohama. And in Yokohama, there was a foreign um, area, a neighborhood, uh, and um, this is a map of it from 1863. So you can you know, keep those foreigners contained. Uh, the US legation, um, there was a U.S. legation here. There was um, also uh, French and British um, and the Dutch. Uh, the Russians don't have that much of a role to play, uh, but these were the main players there. There was also a U.S. consulate, which was separate uh, from the um, U.S. legation. So this is what um, Yokohama looked like at the time. And it had it often had these large ships in the bay. Uh, most of those ships were not Japanese. The Japanese were very eager to buy ships, uh, but um, they didn't have much in the way of a shipbuilding industry themselves. And so even when they did uh, get ships, uh, they were purchasing ships from foreign powers. Uh, and Prime was actually one of the people responsible for that. That's an entirely different talk, but in the q and if you have questions about that, um, please let me know. Uh, so after Prime gets kicked out of Edo, what happens? Um, he actually becomes much more sort of social. When he's up in Edo, he's the only one up there is kind of lonely as visitors sometimes. But when he gets down to the Kanagawa Yokohama area, um, he becomes part of that social life. The expats in that area maintained uh, very Western style social lives. They would have lectures, they had sermons, they had churches. 
Um, they held parties or balls. They had amateur theatricals. They had a regatta. I'm going to say a little bit more about those last two because there's some related material in the Albany Institute. Um, here's a flyer from one of the amateur theatricals. Uh, and this, uh, you can see, it's sort of an interesting um, production. And at the very bottom, I know that print is very hard to say, it says the band uh, of the HMS Uriels will be the, the band for this event. Um, so that whatever ship was in port was important because the sailors from those ships played a big role in these events. Um, here's another uh, example of a of a um, flyer from a theatrical. This one's from 1864. Just kind of fun taste, little tiny tastes of what um, life was like. Uh, and here's a third. This is also 1864, the last performance of the season uh, of the amateur theatricals. Prime would go occasionally, and then every time he'd go, he'd tell his wife that he went, and then somehow excuse it. Like he, he would say, well, I, I didn't want to go, but Bertie wanted to go, so we went, and it was okay. Right? He, I think he saw them as kind of beneath himself. Um, they also had entertainers like this guy uh, who called himself many different things. In this flyer, he's called Washington D. Simmons. Uh, and uh, Prine says, with the above exception, he's talking to his wife, nothing of interest has transpired. Theatricals. Concerts, jugglers, ex exhibitions are the order of the night. A Mr. Simmons, an excellent juggler, is now here. He was unable to pay his passage to San Francisco and gave an exhibition. Tickets $2 and received $400. His handbills, which we're seeing here on the screen, his handbills gave the representation of a man holding his head under his arm. It is said Japanese circulating these were arrested by the government. One version says, because it was understood as threatening foreigners. As the handbills were in English, this could not have been really supposed. Another version is that the governor thought it foreshadowed a miracle and was a renewal of the pretensions made when the Portuguese were here, the Portuguese uh, uh, Catholics. He says at that time, there were persons pretending they possessed supernatural power and ascended to heaven, etc., etc., And it looked as if it bordered on the supernatural. Mr. Hall of the Eldridge had several tickets, so Burr and I accepted his invitation to see Mr. Simmons, whose performance has excelled at any I have seen. So he didn't want to go, but somebody had tickets, so he went and checked this guy out. Um, and then my absolute favorite is the Yokohama International Regatta. I, I really would like to do a separate paper on this. Uh, this was supposed to be held on October 1st and 2nd. It was delayed a week because of bad weather. Uh, and it was a two-day event in which, if it floated, it was there. It was part of the regatta. Uh, and here, very, very quickly, I'm just going to run through the first day. You can see you've got launches, pinnacles, barges, cutters, another cutter race, uh, a gig race, a whale boat race, the second gig race, the private gig race, the dinghy race. Like I said, if it floated, it was there. The skip race, the copper punt race, and my absolute favorite, the cook's tub race. And you might be wondering, what is a cook's tub race? Well, this is what Prime says. There was a curious and novel race in cook's tubs from a vessel distant about 200 yards to the stand. The tubs were propelled by a double paddle, one end of which was dipped on one side and the other on the opposite side. And as there was a great tendency to whirl around as to go forward, the paddle had to be whirled around the head very briskly. One of the tubs reached the sand stand safely, one was blown far off its course, and two, most treacherously, slipped from under their occupants, who managed nevertheless to reach the stand, either in or above their tubs, somewhere between them and the bottom. I just find, I find that a fantastic image. Uh, and initially I thought, wow, what must the Japanese who were watching all this have thought of these foreigners in cook's tubs kind of spinning around with kayak paddles. Uh, I did a little bit of digging and I discovered that, um, actually much later, so maybe, they, maybe the Japanese got this idea from this cook's tub race, I don't know. This tradition started off in, um, in modern day Izu Peninsula, uh, on the modern day Izu Peninsula. Uh, and I uh, found all kinds of photos of indeed a cook's tub race. So here you see two kids doing this. They do this annually in Izu. Uh, but they didn't start doing it until the early 20th century. So 
That's why I said maybe they got the idea. So you can just try to imagine these um, sailors. All right, so let me come back to um, this issue of the foreigners and um, kind of the dangerous uh, world that Pine is living in. Uh, it was not necessarily a safe place to be. Uh, there was a lot of danger being foreign in the Bakamatsu. Bakamatsu is a Japanese word that means the end of the rule of the shogun. Um, so there was a big regime change, and it happens officially in um, 1868. So this is prior to Prime doing that, um, uh, to, prior to Prime being in Japan. Um, there were rebellious uh, daimyo. They were constantly threatened. So they're like governors, regional governors, uh, and they are in, they were um, in a struggle with the central government, with the shogun's government, and um, they were opposed to the idea of having foreigners in the country at all. And um, so the assassination of foreigners, just because they were foreigners and no other particular reason, um, was not uncommon. And um, it happened with alarming, I think, alarming frequency, um, including um, the first one that most historians talk about, Henry Huxin, uh, or Huskin, sorry. There was also one uh, in 1862, a man named Charles Richardson, uh, and then while Prine is there in 1863, um, uh, Henri Camus, right? Um, and his wife would hear about these things uh, indirectly from the U.S. government too, but then Prine would, uh, you know, write to her. Uh, and what he, what he writes is consistent, you know, he'll say, here was this terrible thing that happened, but don't worry, I'm being really careful. Uh, I think that she probably dreaded getting those letters. I think they probably would have been hard to read. Um, so this is a picture by Beato. This is not held by the Institute, but it's a pretty well-known picture of some of these rebellious samurai. Uh, this was actually taken a few years after Prime left Japan uh, and they're plotting uh, to overthrow that central government again. So Prime says, the departure of the John Jay is postponed until tomorrow at daylight, at which time it will, without further delay, sail. I received yesterday a letter, which Mr. Brown is translating, said to be a summons from the tycoon to some of the most powerful daimyos to meet him at Yeddo to arrange for the expulsion of foreigners. He is now free from actual restraint. Whether this movement is serious or not, we cannot even anticipate. The rulers of Japan are performing a play on a grand stage, which is farce, comedy, and tragedy intermingled. We cannot tell until the curtain falls and the actors walk the streets of everyday life, which will predominate. All we can do now is to watch the motions and guess what is the prevailing tone. The faces are masked and no feature or emotion betrays the real feeling. We have all kinds of rumors to which I have learned to pay no attention and all kinds of speculation to which I never attribute any value. Meanwhile, everything goes on merry as a marriage bell and the disinterested observer, neither blinded by interest or led away by feeling, would be inclined to laugh at the idea of danger. We have business and pleasure flowing freely in their accustomed and almost well-worn channels. Everything seen almost impalpable open conflict with what is heard. We have no marrying and giving in marriage because there is no raw material. But with that exception, we are as unconcerned as the antediluvians and yet a storm may come here as suddenly and out of as clear a sky. Everyone goes armed in this Eastern world since I have been absent from Edo, he means. I have slept with a pistol under my pillow and most of the time with one also by my side. The pistol is carried even to church. Mrs. Winchester, the wife of the British consul, formerly carried two pistols in her pocket. I cannot say whether she is still on a war footing or not, but this is only precautionary and does not even give us a moment's thought. Oh, his poor wife. <laughs> she reads this. <laughs> um, and then he writes this. As the mail was closing, the governor of this place was made known to the consuls that a foreigner had been wounded or killed about two and a half miles from this place. 
Colonel Fisher reached the spot in advance of the British and French guard, which was sent out and then found the body of Lieutenant Camus, 3rd Battalion d'Afrique, a most amiable officer and friend of the family of Admiral Joyet. His body was taken to the residence of the French minister, and when I visited him, I saw it. You know, I am not so much given to such sightseeing and would rather go miles out of the way to avoid it than make any effort to minister them to what I regard as a morbid appetite. And you can sort of feel him building uh, up to what comes next, right? So he tells his wife this uh, lieutenant was murdered and I'm not really giving into such sightseeing, but here's the story. Right? Um, and he says, shall I describe the awful appearance? If you do not wish to read it, pass it by. I should first say Lieutenant Camus was entirely unarmed and it's impossible he could have given any provocation. He had remarked only this morning that he thought it unnecessary to carry armor, that he thought the Japanese very friendly and had never been molested and had no fear. The people in this neighborhood say he was murdered by these two sordid men. His right arm was cut off just below the shoulder. The left shoulder was cut through and the arm only connected to the body by a shred of flesh. The same blow had sliced off the left side of the face and passed clean through the body to the region of the heart. Another blow had severed the jugular vein and yet another had from the side of the neck severed the spinal column. The nose had been cut across and laid open and also the chin, but enough. There were other wounds, but this description will more than suffice. I do not give it because I suppose it will make you feel comfortable, but you will soon undoubtedly hear of it, hear enough of it from other sources, though no account will go to the US by this mail. I have given Bertie good advice to be more careful than easy, and what I preach I shall not fail to practice. All that we can do is be prudent and then commit ourselves to the care of our Heavenly Father whose eye never slumbers and whose arm is mighty to deliver. And this is an actual photograph of that murder victim. So there's a lot more that happens to Prine while he's in Japan, uh, but that would be probably a 16 hour lecture. So let me wrap it up by saying, uh, what's Prime's legacy? What happens with him? By the way, this is the photograph that he didn't like. Uh, this is the one that is owned by the Albany Institute. Uh, he felt that it made him look really kind of slovenly, um, but he sent it to his wife. And then when he sent it to his wife, he says, I'm only sending this because uh, I'm, it, it shows how bad a photograph can be. Um, so Prine does eventually leave Japan and he does it in the spring of 1865. Uh, he returns um, to Albany via Europe. By the way, his son, Bertie, left a year before he did. So Bertie finds his way back to Albany a year before Prine leaves Japan. Um, so he goes to Europe. He actually meets his family in Europe. They uh, tour a little bit of Europe together and then they come back to Albany. Conveniently right around the time that um, the Civil War is ending so Prime now doesn't have to worry about uh, dealing with that. Um, and he never returned to this diplomatic life. He never returned to East Asia. So he was not a career diplomat in that respect. Um, but what he did do was he very much prided himself on um, being the, the local, if not the national expert on things Japanese. He collected a tremendous amount of artwork uh, that he sent home to Albany. And um, uh, you know, in addition to the letters, some of that artwork is contained in the collection at the Albany Institute. Uh, and he was constantly telling his wife about um, the importance of this painting or that piece of lacquerware. Uh, and he also looked forward to giving lectures um, about Japan when he returned to uh, Albany. So he was sort of a self-styled expert in that respect. Um, but he didn't uh, then take up being a diplomat um, as a career, right? Um, he did, however, uh, make enough money uh, to pull himself entirely out of debt and then become a bit of a philanthropist when he returned to Albany. So this experience increased his social reputation and it also increased uh, his financial stability. And that's why I think in the end, it was a, it was a good experience for him. So I'll stop there because uh, I know we're going to
the Q&A and I'll say thank you for listening uh, and um, I'll turn it over again. Okay, great. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Fussler? If you want to type them into the chat function. I want to say, so Erica, Erica Sanger is in the audience and she um, corrected me that Gulick wasn't really picked up by Prime in Hawaii, but he was the son of Hawaii missionaries. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to highlight. I, can I add something about Gulick? It's Phoebe. I'm, I know I'm called Isabella, but it's Phoebe. <laughs> yes, absolutely, yeah. Phoebe. Right, so my cat I had. When my <laughs> anyway, the Gulick family went on to run these wonderful camps for children in Vermont, and my family is still involved with those camps. I don't know if you're aware of that. No, I didn't know that. You're going to be thrilled to hear that the pictures are at the Institute, so we're going to be getting some researchers, I'm sure, from up there. The camps are absolutely wonderful. It's called the Aloha Camps, and they pick up a lot of the Hawaiian stuff from the Gulicks when they were missionaries in Hawaii. So he, I found this very interesting. So he really doesn't do, he doesn't build on this experience at all when he gets home. Um, yeah, he doesn't, I mean, in terms of, he, he builds on, he, well, he capitalizes on it, right? Um, but he doesn't build on it. He doesn't decide he's going to become a career diplomat. And most of the other people, most of the other ministers, not just American ministers, but the French and the British um, and the Dutch, they were career, they tend to be career diplomats. Right. Uh, so they, you know, maybe they were serving in China and then they moved off to Japan and then, you know, went somewhere else. So, so Prime was kind of unusual in that respect. He was this, you know, kind of out of place family man. Um, and, and that I, I think that it was in a way socially isolating for him. Um, some of the other people's who were contemporaries of his in Japan uh, indicate that he was kind of, I don't know, in modern terms, we'd say he's kind of stuck up uh, hoity -toity, uh, with the community and they, they weren't particularly happy about that. But he had no achievements, you could say, in his time. Yeah, <laughs> well, and he was, um, uh, he was very prudent and very careful about these social events. Uh, he was very critical about uh, people who got together drinking and some of the, the um, things that the sailors who came ashore would do and had a bad reputation they caused for foreigners. So um, I think that he got this reputation of being kind of no fun uh, <laughs> as, <laughs> as a neighbor. Interesting. Thank you. We do have two questions coming through the group chat. The first is, did Prime have any contact with Japanese locals uh, who were not government officials? And that's coming from Stella. Um, good question, Stella. Um, he, he had servants. He had a collection of servants, and I, I've only been able to identify two of them. And actually, I've been in touch with the um, with some historians in Yokohama and asked them if they could help me identify the others. And they said, "No, they can't, because there's just apparently no records of who the others were." Um, and even the officials, if Prime doesn't identify them by name. So it's hard to know, besides a few of the really, really high ranking people might say, I, meet, I met with this particular minister, then he'll identify them by name. But often he'll say, oh, I have an official coming to visit me today, but we can't figure out who that person was because he never you know, gives us a name. Um, so uh, I think his contact with uh, Japanese outside of formal meetings was relatively limited. And 
Um, there's no indication that he really learned Japanese. There's one place in the letters, only one, where he says to his wife, um, and I think he's describing uh, being um, pulled out of the house, out of the burning uh, legation, um, that uh, he says they must have been speaking poorly or something like that because I couldn't understand them, the Japanese servants. And I thought, why would native speakers be speaking poorly? It, it just, it seemed very kind of defensive to me. And there's no other indication that Prime himself studied Japanese. Now, Bertie did. I don't know how proficient he got, uh, but it's mentioned a couple times in the letters that Bertie uh, was doing kind of an exchange. So he was helping some Japanese learn English and in exchange they were teaching him some Japanese, but I don't think it ever got really fluent. What Prine did was he depended on Portman, who was Anton Portman, who was sort of one of his right hand men. He was the official translator. Uh, and Portman was a Dutch born American and uh, was bilingual in um, Dutch and English. And so in, this, in the early days of Japanese history, uh, or in, in early days of, of the modern era, um, Japanese, uh, it was, it was really unusual to find anybody who could speak, any Japanese who could speak English. Um, the foreign language that anybody in, who was in Japan had learned between, say, the year 1600 and 1868, um, if they were going to learn any foreign language, any European language, it was um, Dutch. And there's a historical reason, reason for that we don't need to go into. But so what happened was that for communication, uh, and Prime records this in his letters also, um, the Japanese would say something to um, someone who could understand Japanese and Dutch, and then, the, then that person would translate from Japanese to Dutch, and then there'd be a third person who would translate from Dutch to English. Um, so it was a, not, was a, not a two-step process, but a three-step process. Now I thought, when I first started doing this, that maybe Prine was a great choice because he, he, he identified as a Dutchman. And he's always talking about Dutch this and Dutch that. Um, but uh, in the end, I, I think that wasn't the case. And there's a, there's a letter he says to his wife uh, that he enjoys hearing Dutch and he hopes that maybe he could get to the point where he could speak some of it. Um, so if he just hears it and it sounds good to his ears, but he doesn't really speak it, then he's not part of that interpretation world. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> so I think that's from Beth. Uh, she's asking how living in Japan inspired Cam Santanoni. Um, that's a good question. That, you know, that, that gets repeated over and over again. And, and I did go on the um, Institute trip to Santanoni a while back. And I've looked through the book and heard all the stories, um, but there's there's one kind of big hole in that story. So if you if you're familiar with this Camp Santanoni, the the building complex uh, is said to look like a building complex called Pyodoin, which is still extant today in Japan. Uh, and the, uh, the, the hypothesis was that um, Bertie was inspired by Biodoin to build Santanoni the way that he did. But here's the problem. Biodoin is located in the uh, south of Kyoto, and Bertie never went there. And, and so he never saw it. There's no way he could have seen it. Um, and I can't think of really famous paintings of kind of thing that he might have run into and this is before photography is uh, you know, widely spread and people aren't taking pictures of Yodoin yet so um, maybe there are architectural elements about the uh, traditional Japanese um, temples that inspired Bertie uh, but I can't quite bring myself to believe the Yodoin hypothesis
Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions come up. Um, I do want to thank you all. Um, I know a few people have said it in the chat, but thank you so much, Dr. Fessler. Um, round of applause. Uh, we do appreciate you um, providing us with this excellent opportunity. Um, for everyone who's still tuned in, please uh, check out our website. Um, we will be giving more information about other programs. So thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate all the work you've done, Dr. Fessler. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you.